My name is Isaac Bogosh. I'm one of the physicians and uh, uh, ID and HIV providers at the Toronto General Hospital. And uh, I was asked to talk about uh, the Toronto General Hospital HIV Prevention Clinic. Um, and uh, it's a great segue from uh, James's review of the science and evidence behind uh, PrEP use. And we'll talk about how this might be implemented in, uh, in real world settings. So first we'll talk a little bit about the backgrounds and the goals of the clinic, what we offer, how we offer it, uh, some data, and then some concluding remarks. And uh, just to mention, I know there's been a lot of information that's come out with PrEP use. Um, I was asked to talk about this clinic, but if you have any questions at all about PrEP use and some of the new studies that have come out recently, James did a great job at uh, summarizing all the data, but we'll both be available afterwards to talk about this in, in more detail. So just a bit of background, as we know, HIV is a major, major issue in Toronto, Ontario, worldwide. And of course, the MSM community is disproportionately affected. HIV prevention, as we've seen recently, is a very large unmet uh, need. There's multiple resources in the city of Toronto and throughout Ontario. Probably could use some better coordination between these resources. Now, Toronto General uh, has a history of being a very strong leader in HIV care and research, not traditionally known for HIV prevention. And again, we're talking about downtown Toronto and, uh, and, and this neighborhood here. We all really live in the same few city blocks here, and HIV prevention is a large unmet need. So the goal here was to build a comprehensive HIV prevention clinic, really facilitating interdisciplinary care, working with local programs and local clinics throughout the, the GTA. And also, ultimately, we want to provide world-class, patient-centered care, research, education, and community support to really meet the needs of our local community. So in late 2012, we spoke with local stakeholders in the community. So this was HIV providers, primary care physicians, HIV outreach workers and groups, big clinics like the Maple Leaf Clinic, the Hassle Free Clinic, I should mention 410 Sherburne as well. We were all, we, we had uh, some nice conversations on what, what really were the needs of, of the local community. And we finally received uh, permission to house this HIV prevention clinic at the Toronto General Hospital HIV Clinic, thanks to Rupert. So we designed PEP protocol, so not just HIV uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, also post-exposure prophylaxis. So we designed PEP protocols for the clinic and for the emergency departments. We designed PrEP protocols for the clinic. We set up data collection tools. And there was the perception by some that, you know, this might not be successful. You know, we don't see those types of patients here. This might not be uh, a very successful clinic. You might be sitting there twiddling your thumbs, but it's the classic field of dreams. You know, if you build it, they will come. And they sure did, you know. So what we offer, we offer HIV post-exposure prophylaxis. So this is comprehensive care uh, and follow-up for patients who have had a high-risk HIV exposure. We'll follow individual patients for up to six months after an exposure. We'll follow higher-risk patients longer, and we'll transfer eligible PEP patients onto PrEP. We also offer HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, and we'll follow eligible people indefinitely every three months while they're on PrEP. We also offer care for what we call the in-betweeners or the undecided. This is a group of people that are not on PEP or have recently finished PEP. They're definitely candidates for PrEP, but they're not willing or not yet um, ready for PrEP. And this is almost exclusively a very, uh, this is almost exclusively a population of men who have sex with men. Now, the, the clinic offers mental health and counseling services. We can liaise with the local community. We have a direct transition of care to HIV. If, if people do seroconvert, we were in an HIV clinic, so we can have direct transition to HIV care if possible. And we have you know, three full-time nurses. Uh, there's Tanya and Christine. I don't know if I have a pointer here. Anyways, uh, Pauline Murphy, who's not here. She wasn't there for picture day, which was <laughs> 9 a.m. to 9.02 a.m. yesterday morning. So that's the uh, garden gnome on her desk. Uh, Andrea Sharp is our social worker. We have a psychiatrist. We have a lowly MD running this as well and a pharmacist. And we were really just utilizing, some might say hijacking, the pre-existing resources of a very well-funded HIV clinic. But we were able to repurpose these resources into a specific HIV prevention clinic. Now, we basically see a lot of people in the downtown core, but lately we've been seeing a lot of people uh, throughout the GTA. We have three emergency departments directly linked with the clinic. So the Toronto General, the Toronto Western, and Mount Sinai Hospital. So people go into any one of those hospitals with an exposure, 
There's protocols in place in those emergency departments. They know exactly what blood tests to order, what drugs to put them on. They get fed directly to our clinics. We have excellent follow-up with them. We also get referrals from primary care physicians locally, and now more recently, word is out, and we're getting uh, referrals from all over, not just the GTA, I'd say Southern Ontario. Now, how do we determine PrEP eligibility? As uh, James uh, just pointed out, we don't really have Canada-wide guidelines, so we rely heavily on the CDC guidelines that were published in 2014. These are fantastic. They're comprehensive. They're written for every level to understand, um, and they're, they're really the gold standard of care for PrEP care worldwide. This is not meant for you to read. It's meant to remind me who is eligible for PrEP, who should go on PrEP, who should we consider for PrEP. And really, we talk about men who have sex with men, uh, um, uh, injection drug users, and either heterosexual women or men who are at high risk of HIV acquisition. And it just very simply goes through what high risk means. And of course, this is very broadly defined. There's no cookie cutter answers here. It also goes through what are the initial investigations we should perform, how we should monitor people, what the appropriate follow-up is. Now, in our clinic, we enroll uh, eligible patients that are at high risk. It's almost exclusively men who have sex with men. And of course, we do a history, a good physical exam. We look at their motivation as well. I mean, just because people are eligible for PrEP, it doesn't mean they're going to take it or they're going to want to take it. And of course, we do some baseline screening tests, which are clearly, I, I'm not going to go through all the, uh, the, uh, the guidelines. I mean, this is a 20-minute read and they're comprehensive, but we go through all the appropriate tests. And of course, this is an opportunity for preventative care as well. So we use this opportunity to vaccinate people who are not yet immune to hepatitis A and B, for example. We obtain Truvada. Now, there's an asterisk there because this is way beyond uh, the level for a, I don't know, a 25-minute discussion. Please come find me after and we can talk about different strategies to access this drug. We've had some successes, we've had some failures. Uh, this is tricky, but uh, the pendulum is definitely swinging towards the side of success. So we get to Truvada. I'm saying that with confidence. And then we follow up with individuals every three months. Okay, and this is dogmatic. No one gets uh, prescriptions for longer than three months because we want to keep a close eye on individuals. And, of course, we're looking at things like adherence to their medications, any side effects from their medications. We screen them for sexually transmitted infections. Of course, we screen them for uh, HIV. And, you know, this is an opportunity. These are teachable moments here in clinic. This is, these are opportunities for safe sexual counseling. And, of course, remember, this is happening outside of these giant well-funded, randomized, placebo-controlled trials. This is real-world PrEP practice. The other thing that we address at every clinic appointment is, do you still need PrEP? And this is actually one of the more interesting areas because every three months we come in, and, and that's one of the first questions I ask people. And you'd be amazed that people that are high, high, high risk, you know, these are home run, slam dunk, you need PrEP, after about three months or six months, a lot of people's lifestyle change. You know, every, not, not everyone's taking a, a linear path through life. And some people say, you know what? I'm in a monogamous relationship now. I don't think I need this. And, of course, we give them our card and say, come on back. We're, we're, we're always here. If you feel this is something you might need later on down the line, give us a shout. We're always here for you. Just a little bit of data from our clinic, and this is real-world data. Like I mentioned, we started the clinic kind of twiddling our thumbs but over two years, it's turned into a bit of a monster, and the clinic can be sometimes of a, a, a bit of a zoo at times. Um, we've seen 175 new referrals in clinic. Now, that's just not 175 patients. Remember, every one of these individuals has multiple, multiple follow-ups. So this is this is a, a lot of uh, it's a it's a busy clinic. We've had 143 people referred primarily for PEP. We've had 32 people referred primarily for PrEP, and of course, many of our PEP referrals are now on PrEP or actively being considered for PrEP. We, you have to find a time to actually cut the data and analyze it, and we did some uh, analysis in September of 2014. At that time, we were looking at 99 patients that were referred for PEP who were evaluated for PrEP. The people we're seeing in our clinic mostly are male. They're mostly uh, you know, in their late 20s or early 30s. 68% are white. And uh, of the males, 55%, that's a lower percent than I would have thought, about 55% are men who have sex with men. Now, at the time that this analysis was performed, we found that 31% of people who presented for post-exposure prophylaxis would meet the CDC guideline criteria for pre-exposure prophylaxis. That's a lot higher than I would have thought. 
Uh, of the, uh, 19%, so most, about two-thirds of that 31%, were actually interested in starting PrEP at that time. Remember, this is a moving target. And again, at that time, we, got, uh, we had 7% of people uh, that were successfully initiated on PrEP. So this is the cascade of care from NPEP, for post-exposure prophylaxis, to PrEP. Now, of course, this is, I don't know if I can, is there a laser? This is a moving target, right? We've had a lot of successes more recently in getting people who are eligible and willing to go on PrEP on the drug. So this is slightly out of date, but it just goes to show you that there is still a huge disparity of people on the drug who want and should be on the drug. Now, it's kind of neat. We looked at factors that were associated with PrEP candidacy. So who was a candidate for PrEP? Some things that aren't so surprising, you know, sexual exposures to HIV, so not as much uh, uh, intravenous drug use, um, prior NPEP use, so people that have recognized that they've had high-risk exposures in the past and are really seeking other methods to prevent HIV exposure. Again, not so surprising. I guess not so surprising here is but lack of drug insurance. So a lot of people who are – and this is a, a multifactorial – regression analysis, your master's of epidemiology here, so you can tell us all about that. But really, lack of drug insurance seems to be a major, major problem in people who are eligible for PrEP. So let's put a big asterisk beside that and, uh, and chat about that a bit later on. Um, have we had any seroconversions? Luckily, no. We've had no seroconversions with our post-exposure prophylaxis. We have no seroconversions on patients with pre-exposure prophylaxis. However, we had two patients with acute uh, HIV infection that was diagnosed during their PrEP evaluation. None of these people were exposed to Truvada, so they hadn't initiated PrEP. We made the diagnosis, and it was interesting. They're actively seroconverting in clinic, and they were diagnosed. And this is uh, I think a very important point, because uh, James discussed some of the risks of putting people with acute HIV or, or chronic HIV on a two-drug regimen. So some final remarks here. I think PrEP is certainly an, a large unmet need in Toronto. Uh, we need to build greater capacity to offer this service at primary care facilities. I think we should take this outside of you know, subspecialty clinics. This is something that can be offered in primary care facilities. But in order to scale up, we really have to ensure that this can be judiciously and safely delivered. And really, it's probably best delivered in an interdisciplinary clinic. And the reason I say that is, I mean, I lean heavily on our nursing staff, our pharmacy, our social work, our psychiatry staff. And this really is uh, interdisciplinary care. Uh, judiciously, I say because, you know, sometimes if you read the guidelines, you see that, um, you know, people, you might think that people are handing out PrEP like it's Halloween candy, and really it, it shouldn't be. I mean, there, I think this is still for a, uh, a select and slightly narrow group of, uh, of individuals that meet criteria. And lastly, I think we need to advocate more and more for, for drug coverage, especially here in uh, Toronto and, and throughout Canada. I think I'll stop there. Oh, and uh, that's my email address. If you have any questions at all at any time, please don't hesitate to, to email me, and I'll be around for a bit as well to chat. Thanks very much.